How's it going, everybody? YouTube land, whatever. Um, so, about what, like a month ago, right? I started talking about um, Shion Sono. And, um, yeah, man, like I, I, like, I wanted to do, like, a little series about, like, his films and shit like that, because I was super excited about him. You know what I mean? Like, I, like I, I watched, like, a ton of them in a row, and I got all fucking freaked out about it, and I got all excited, and I just never did anything with it. Well, fuck it. I'm going to continue it, like, right now. I'm drinking my little mineral water here, and then I'm going to continue it. Ah, uh, sorry if I'm a little, like, fucking low energy or whatever. There's a uh, weather changed here, like, on the east coast of the United States. Well, maybe not the east coast, more like the... The Midwest, I guess. I don't know where the fuck I live. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it got super cold, and it's like April, and now I'm all fucking... It just, like, whipped me straight in the ass with a wet towel. It, it did the locker room stuff, and now I just feel fucking crazy. That's not that's not a problem. Okay, check it out. So, se <laughs> the second fucking uh, Shion Sono movie I'm going to talk about is Why Don't You Play in Hell? From 2013, 14, something like that. It's awesome. It's really fucking good, right? Um, a lot of people, like, just kind of don't really care about it for some fucking reason. I, like, I, I, don't, I don't really know why. It's really cool. Mm. Nom, 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 nom. It's like... Okay, so here's the plot, right? Before anything else. Okay. So, <laughs> there's this group of, like, high school students or whatever. They call themselves the Fuck Bombers. <laughs> the Fuck Bombers. Right? And they're, they're just, like, they like to make films and shit. And like, that's their whole thing. They're super obsessed with films. They're fucking excited about it. And, like, they go on this little, um... They go on, like, a film shoot. And they find, like, a group of, uh... Just, like, fucking, like... I don't know, like, uh, like, hooligans and shit, like, fighting in an alleyway. And they bail on that. Like, on what they're shooting or whatever, and they just go over to shoot this fucking hooligan fight, right? And, like, they meet, like, the fourth member of the little crew and shit, and, like, they try to make him an action star and stuff, like, on the, along the lines of, like, Bruce Lee. They're like, you're gonna be the Japanese Bruce Lee, even though we all know that Sunny Chiba's the fucking Japanese Bruce Lee. Makes a lot more than that as well. Sunny Chiba's awesome. Anyway. But they're, like, blocking up this, uh... This little alleyway in the fight and stuff. And, um... This truck's coming through to, like, deliver... A sign... To... This gangster... Boss... His, like, his new... Um... Like, his new mistress. Like, all of his mistresses for some reason, of, of this, like, gangster boss, like, they run, like, a restaurant, like, successively. It's, it's, it's weird. So they're gonna, like, deliver the sign, and, like, they go through and, like, deliver that shit, and we find out that this, this gangster guy's fucking, fucking around with his wife, right? Or fucking around on his wife, like, behind her back. So, you know, we, we get all that exposition and shit, and, um, like, while this guy's at his little, like, bar, restaurant, or whatever, like, tr transferring it to his new mistress, um, like, a rival, like, gangster clan fucking, like, attacks his house and tries to kill him and stuff, and his wife just fucking murders, like, everybody who tries to, who tries to fucking attack him. She, she's just, like, chopping carrots with a kitchen knife, and she just goes crazy. She just goes full Lady Snowblood on him, like, 100% stabbing motherfuckers, like, to the point where... The whole, like, floor of the place is, like, just fucking, like, covered in blood. Because, like, the next scene you get is, um, like, her daughter. Like, their daughter that they have together. Like, the crime boss and his wife. Um, she's, like, she's got, like, a a toothpaste commercial, like, career going where she sings this weird fucking jingle about, like, gnashing her teeth with frustration and, like, freaking out and doing all this, like, weird stuff and just, like, brushing your teeth with this crazy toothpaste. And it's super catchy, and it goes throughout the entire fucking movie, and it's awesome. And it's, like, a big deal. Like, within the, you know, I'll get to the themes and shit later after I fucking just explain, like, the first 20 minutes of this madcap romp into 
severed limbs and crazy shit. But anyway, she comes home from her little, like, commercial shoot. And, like, everyone's real excited about it, like, on the street. You can tell. And, like, people are, like, getting crushes on her and stuff, even though she's, like, fucking nine years old. And, um, so she comes back home. And nobody's there, but the floor is just, like, a pool of blood. It looks super awesome. And, like, she comes home, she's singing her weird little jingle. She's wearing a white dress, and she steps on the, on the floor of, like, her living room. And it's just, like, a swamp of, like, just red. And it's, like, just reflecting, like, the ceiling. Super cool looking. So she, like, meets one of the gangsters that was trying to kill her dad in the kitchen. And they, like, have this weird, like, bond together, like, suddenly. Like, he gets, like, a weird obsession with her at that point. And, um, which gets into one of the, uh, things that this movie's, like, about. Which is, like, weird obsessions. Mm. I apologize. But, like, that shit happens when that gangster leaves, and he, uh, runs into those fucking guys. The fuck bombers, right? He, he runs into them, like, while he's, like, dying and fucking, like, dragging himself along the, along the, uh, like a wall, you know, and getting all disgusting. And he lets him, he gets all excited to, like, let him film, and, like, let him film and bleed all over this wall. It's like he, it's like he goes around a corner. It's awesome. But, yeah. The gangster's wife gets thrown in jail for, like, just doing, like, a ton of murders, and it fucks up his, uh, daughter's fucking advertising career. Like, she, she can no longer be an actress because, like, her parents are, like, just famously into gangland murder and shit, so, like, she loses her commercial and stuff. And that's kind of, like, that's just the whole setup for the movie, you know? Like, after that, it gets kind of, you know, like, shit happens, like, because it's, like, ten years later at that point, and, um... Like, all the people who, who have a crush on this fucking girl, right? She's, like, 19 now, you know, which is, so it's fine, <laughs> right? But she's, like, super obsessed with, like, having an acting career, and it's making her weird, and she's, like, running off on her gangster dad, and everyone's fucking, like, freaking out. She's, like, she kind of becomes, like, a violent, like, menacing person. Like, she has an old boyfriend. She does a bunch of weird shit, too. You know, and she meets, like, a guy who, like, saw her on TV, like, in a shop window, and, like, they kind of have this thing together, and the, um, gangster's wife is getting out of jail for, like, the murders and stuff, and, like, a, like, a matter of, like, days, and, like, he, uh, he was promising that he was gonna shoot a movie with his daughter in it to, like, springboard her career and stuff, because, like, you know, he, he feels like he owes her, like, a lot, because he was cheating on her, and she killed all these guys for him, right? And she went to jail for it, and it's a big deal. And here's my little kitty Pantera, snuggling around. Hey, come on. Sit right there. Okay, but, um, yeah, so he's trying to make this movie, and she keeps fucking running out on it, doing a bunch of weird shit, so that he really has to get it done, right? Before his wife gets out of jail, because it's, like, it's her fixation that her daughter has to make a movie, you know, and be, like, a fucking, like, a famous person, and it's his fixation that his wife should be happy when she gets out of jail, you know, so he fucking, like, a, he fucking, like, sorry, my cat's fucking distracting me, he, um, that's weird, my brain just fucking shut off for a minute, okay, he, uh, <laughs> he, like, threatens the guy who got a crush on his daughter from watching her shop window when she was nine into making a fucking movie starring her. And he doesn't know what the fuck he's doing, but he just kind of, like, agrees to direct it to, like, save his own ass because there's, like, fucking Yakuza guys everywhere and they got him, like, imprisoned in their little, like, crime office and shit and they're, like, all threatening him and crap. So he's like, yeah, we'll do it, whatever, you know. And, um, he ends up hooking up with the fuck bombers, right? And they, like, kind of take over the whole thing because they've always wanted to, like... They're, they're like, film enthusiasts, right? And they're, uh... They're all about, like, the, um... Like, the, like the various, like, formats of film and how, like, 35... Like, shooting on 35 millimeters is, like, what you want to do. And, you know, it's part of, like, the big art form and shit, but it's so expensive. And, like, the... The, um... Uh, head gangster, like, gives them all this money to do it. And, like, you know, they give them, like, cameras and, like money for film and shit, and, like, all, all, like, his entire gang, like, at his disposal, the disposal, and, like, while all this is going on, 
the gangsters who tried to kill the guy before. This is like real convoluted when I'm talking about it, but it's awesome. <laughs> right, including the one who got the weird obsession with his daughter. Um, they've all like moved into a castle and shit, and they're like acting like fucking like super old timey like Japanese people. Like they're uh, they <laughs> they like have like a little stronghold, and they're like fucking like rocking like the like the samurai clothes and shit, and like carrying swords around and being all weird. But, like, they still want to kill that guy. And, like, their little, their gangster feud's still going on. So, you know, they're going to have a fucking fight. And, like, they're, like, the movie's, like, leading up to this fight. So what they decide to do is the fuck bombers decide to just, like, make a snuff film out of it. And just... <laughs> out of this gangster fight, right? They're like, okay, well, you guys are going to fight anyway. And they're like, yeah, let's all, you know, let's all, we're going to fight it out. So, you know... They fucking, like, just decide to film that shit and, like, orchestrate it like it's, like, the end of, like, a fucking, like, a 60s-ass, like, samurai movie or, like, you know, like, a 70s, like, fucking Japanese gangster movie. So, so they go down there and they fucking, like, they give everybody swords, right? Because it's, like, the most Japanese fucking thing to fight people with, right? So they're all excited about it. And, um... <laughs> they, like, orchestrate this whole thing and direct this entire, like, giant gang fight murder scene. Like, in this weird castle and shit with, like, these super traditionally dressed, like, old-timey guys and, like, these kind of, like, modern, like, suit-wearing gangsters. And it, it's just fucking bloodshed and, like, crazy. And you, you guys know, if you've seen... If you, went and, if you went and saw Suicide Club, you know, then you then, then you know that, uh... Fucking Shion Sono does not fuck around when it comes to blood. Like, you know, there's no taste level. Going on with Gore in his movies. He likes to freak right the fuck out, right? So, you know, they take that to the next level. Even with the, um, when the gangster's wife is, like, murdering people, there's one part where she chases a guy up onto a roof and just fucking stabs the shit out of him with his knife. And, like, he's just bleeding through a grate in the roof and he's just bleeding all over. Like, fucking, like, horrified bystanders. Everyone's, like, shrieking and, like, being covered in blood. Awesome. So much fun. Right. That's pretty much what goes on in the movie. And there's a weird little twist at the end that I'm not going to fucking give away because it's awesome and goony. And like, it kind of sheds like a completely different light like on the, like on the film itself. Ha! So, nice. Themes in this movie are like really like where, where this whole like thing shines, right? And it's weird because... I've been looking up a lot of, like, interviews with Shion Sono about this and, like, reviews that were written at the time when it came out. Really fucking scathing one from, uh, from Variety magazine, man. Completely misses the point of the film, though. So, I think the dude's name is, uh, James Chang who wrote it. I don't know. I'll look it up later. But he's an idiot because this movie's awesome. <laughs> I don't know what the fuck he's talking about, right? So this movie, like, it's definitely about a whole bunch of crazy shit, and it's awesome on that level, just on, like, a surface reading, right? But, like, then when you start thinking about it a little bit more, it's definitely about, like, kind of the destructive potential of, like, obsession and how it makes people weird. Because everybody in this movie has, like, a weird thing, you know, that just makes them, like, kind of weird and act fucking strange. Like, you got the... Um, like, the gangster who tried to kill the other gangster, right? And got, got like, a weird... He gets, like, a super weird, stalkery, spooky crush on on the guy's daughter, right? <laughs> and he kind of, like, he, he's always, like, singing the toothpaste song and fucking freaking out. And he moves into this castle and he starts acting real fucking weird. <laughs> you know, like, and these guys go along with it, which is awesome. But, yeah, like, his gangster shit kind of suffers from that, you know, like... Because he, he, all he does is hang out in this fucking castle for ten years and, like, plot his revenge and fucking, like, think about this chick. And when she comes back at the end, because they meet each other at the end, it's so funny, man. Because he sees her, like, <laughs> as, like, a 19, 20-year-old. And he's... <laughs> the fucking actor that got to play this guy is awesome. I gotta find his name. Because he is fucking incredible in this role. <laughs> <laughs> he is 
fucking awesome at this. He just makes this face, right? Oh my god. Because, <laughs> like, she shows up, like, in the in the midst of this, like, kind of business deal they're having to get the gangsters to fucking fight each other on film. And she starts singing this little song and he just makes this face. Man. It's awesome. Oh. <laughs> I gotta... I gotta look up the dude's name. I'm sorry. This is gonna take forever. And I do this all the time. Sinichi. Sinichi Sutsume? Sutsumi? Sinichi Sutsumi is the dude... He's in a lot of movies that I haven't seen. One Missed Call, the Japanese version of One Missed Call. Oh, man. What else is he in? Because he is fucking brilliant in this. <laughs> He's so good at it. Oh, man. But particularly the fucking, just the face he makes. Like, in this one scene, he's just like, sucks his fucking lips up, like, way the hell into his head. And he's just like, he's making those, those fucking goony eyes at this lady. He is... Part of the new Space Battleship Yamato. That's cool. Suspect X. I've never seen that. Always. Man, I gotta watch a lot more of those guys' movies. I'm gonna start with One Missed Call. Because. I don't know. It's awesome. Non stop. Yeah, man. I haven't seen shit this guy's in except this. But he's awesome in this. Really super good. Everybody is. Everybody, like, portrays their shit, like pretty expertly, you know, but yeah, like, if I could show you the face, and I might be able to, if I can figure out how to, like, get the clip and stuff, and, like, do things, I'll, I'll, I'll show you the fucking face he makes, it's great. What the hell was I talking about? Destructive obsession, right? So, all the fucking fuck bombers, <laughs> for one thing, they hang out at this, like, disused movie theater. You know, because, like, part of this movie is also, like, the, um... It's kind of chronicling the switch from, like, film to digital, like, in the movie industry. But, uh, they're, <laughs> they always hang out with this, like, disused movie theater. And it starts out, like, they have a mentor. He's, like, this old Japanese dude with, like, a fucking, like, a gray beard and a hat. And, like, when I, when I was looking at him at first, I thought he, uh... I thought he might represent, um... Seijin Suzuki, like, uh, but at the same time, I uh, see fucking Seijin Suzuki in, in, in every movie that has, like, a guy, a Japanese guy with a weird beard who's in the film, you know? <laughs> who looks like a, like an old-timey kind of spooky dude with, like, a fucking turtle lock. I'm pretty sure R100 is supposed to be Seijin Suzuki, but I don't know about this. Could be a lot of guys. A lot of, a lot of directors have beards. <laughs> you know? But, like, they hang out with him, and, you know, they just drink beer all the time. And, like, they end up, at one point in the ten years before the beginning of this movie and the end of it, they end up making this fucking trailer for a samurai movie that they want to make. And it's awesome. <laughs> but, like, that's, like, the pinnacle of, like, their achievements up until that point. And they keep just kind of waiting for, like, their one fucking chance to happen, you know? It, it's kind of, like, fucking them up, because all they do is hang out at this fucking movie theater and watch their trailer over and over again. The trailer's awesome, by the way. Another thing in this movie is visual references. I'm gonna get back around to that, though. So, yeah, Destructive Obsessions. They got, they're fucking up, they're fucking their friend up, I and mean, he's, like, the little action movie guy, you know? Um... Dude, uh, Gangster and his wife, super obsessed with their, uh, their daughter's career. Their daughter wants to be in film, but, like, she's fucking it all up because she's going crazy. She keeps, like, running away from the set and doing a whole bunch of shit, you know. And it all cul culminates into a sweet-ass bloodbath at the end. Very cool. Um, visual references in this movie. Fucking love them, man. I love it when people do this. I love it when, like, directors, cinematographers... Fucking, like, screenwriters. I love it when they put shit that looks like their influences and their favorite shit in their movies, right? So cool. And, like, I, I don't understand why people fucking complain about that. Because, mm, there's a long-standing tradition in, like, literature, fucking plays, the visual arts of, like, if you like shit, you know, you kind of do, like, a little, maybe, like, a little reference to it occasionally. 
You know what I mean? It used to be, like, real bad in, like, the 1600s and or the 15 and 1600s. Like, people just straight up put authors they liked in their fucking... in their book, you know what I mean? And have them have lines and shit. And, like, just take fucking, like, whole bits of text and throw it in there because they were so excited about their shit, you know? Um, I think, when did Dante's Inferno come out? That was, like, 1400s, yeah? I think... Fuck. Now I can't remember. I'm not gonna look that up. It'll take forever. But, um, yeah, like, he, he fucking brought in, like, Virgil and shit for that, and, like, just had him in there, you know? And, like, quoted a whole bunch of shit. Same thing with films. Fucking directors do that shit all the time. And only some of them get shit for it. Which is super weird. Right? Tarantino gets shit for it. Everybody's like, anybody who's a Tarantino director is always like, this guy's he doesn't have any good ideas anymore. Oh, he never did. You know what I mean? Because, like, motherfucker likes movies, you know? He likes a ton of movies. He's seen a ton of movies. He's a fucking fan of movies. And, like, the coolest ones, he'll take some shit from, you know? And he'll throw it into his own personal shit. It's not fucking plagiarism, you know what I mean? Like some people would say, you know? It's totally not. It's just, like, you know... I don't know, Kill Bill, for example, right? Like, fucking Tarantino's obviously, like, a great big lady Snowblood fan, right? Because he just threw a character in there that's, that's pretty much her. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Fucking, well, not, like, entirely, but, like, she looks like her a lot, and they fight in the snow and shit, and she has that parasol with a sword in it. Same thing. Brian De Palma's another one. Everybody fucks with Brian De Palma. All the time. They're like, yo, he just thinks he's Alfred Hitchcock and he doesn't have any original fucking idea. Fuck that. He likes Hitchcock. Fuck yeah. You get a, you know, imitation is, you know, it's one of the highest forms of shit. He still does his own original shit, but he likes, you know, he likes a little Alfred Hitchcock occasionally. He fucking throws it in there. Motherfucking Shion Sono. And this is um, the first movie I've seen where he does this. Like, I haven't seen a lot of his movies. I've only seen Cold Fish. Fucking Suicide Club. I don't know why I couldn't fucking remember that. And uh, this one here. Why did you play in hell? In Tokyo Tribes. I'm trying to track down another one called Love Exposure. That sounds fucking awesome. I can't find it anywhere. But this is the um, this is the one where he goes crazy, right? Because uh, I, I was reading some interviews with this guy, and um. He's like a super big fan of uh, Kenji Fukusaku. Fukusaku, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. He's the dude who uh, directed the Battle Without Honor and Humanity films. Battles Without Honor and Humanity. If you look up Battle Without Honor and Humanity, you get a bunch of Kill Bill shit. Okay. <laughs> Ridiculous. Kenji Fukusaku, I think, is his name. Battles Without I never remember, like, how to pronounce it. I get so scared, you know? Especially with Japanese, because people fucking freak out on the internet if you... <laughs> if you mispronounce anything Japanese, which is super hard to do, which is super easy to do, right? Because... My mouth doesn't make that, those same sounds, you know? I'm like a native English speaker, so I get fucked up, and like, I rarely... Like, I listen to a lot of Japanese, I love a lot of Japanese movies, but I never, like, try to repeat shit, so, like, my weird little nasty baby tongue never works properly. And... Humanity. Haha. <laughs> Kenji Fukusaku! I think is your name. Yeah, Kenji Fukus... Fukusaku. Fuka... Fukusaku. I don't know how to pronounce that. I'm sorry, Kenji. <laughs> I think you're dead, actually. But, um, yeah, man, like, he's a great big fan of this guy, and he throws a whole lot of Kenji Fukusaku in this fucking movie, right? Uh, like, from the first part of the film, there's, like, a fight scene uh, with the uh, hooligans and shit, and it looks like it's filmed like it's, like, straight out of fucking battles with honor and humanity, right? Like, the first one. There's, like, fucking 12 movies in that series. Crazy as hell. Um, and they're awesome. They're super grim and, like, gritty. But 
they're so grim that they go up to the point of just being fucking sweet and like really cool you know like so they kind of miss the point they're kind of like scarface almost in a lot of ways it's like they we're we're gonna be so gritty that we just kind of transition and we're it, it turns into slick that's what battles the hunter and humanity is the whole thing about kenji fukasaku fight scenes is they're just like supernatural and they're like handheld you know they're all like shot handheld and stuff and like that cameraman like gets in the middle of the fucking choreography and like the action it's almost like there was a fight going on already the camera crew found it and filmed it like they do in this movie like exactly right so they're they're like he's translating the um the feeling that everybody gets from kenji fukasaku movies and he's fucking just slapping it right into like his own thing right it's awesome and uh the uh like the gangster like bleeding against the wall and like walking i think that's from the battles without honor and humanity movie as well they all kind of blend together for me but i think that's from the first one and then, and then like there's another theme in this of what people how people act when you point cameras at them because they don't act natural it's like right when they find this the gangster like bleeding on the wall they're like you're so cool holy shit you know like yeah because uh let's uh let's film you and he's like all right awesome and he starts acting all fucking like super <laughs> super cool about it even though he's fucking like bleeding to death and singing that crazy song and shit but yeah like there's visual references like crazy like when the uh guy's wife goes crazy she is doing some it's definitely not like a direct reference but it, she looks a lot like, she's dressed like, and she has her hair like, the lady from Sex and Fury. Or maybe, like, Lady Snowblood. Depending, like, it, it, like just girl sword-wielding people from, like, the 60s and 70s. You know, like, I, but she felt like the Sex and Fury chick to me. Um, when she's, like, attacking these guys and stuff, and she's, like, just fucking stabbing the shit out of them. But yeah, that's, uh, you know, that, that, that rang, like, true in there. You know, and there's like, there's just a whole bunch of shit like that. There's, um, there's a few more, like, Kenji Fukasaku things. And, like, actors that Kenji Fukasaku uses on a regular basis come up in lines of dialogue. Because at the end, right, the guy's trying to, like, coach the fucking, uh, Yakuza guys into how to act, right? So, he's standing there, and he's just, like, and they're not, like, they're, they're not getting it. They're just, like, ready to, like, do a regular fight. And he's like, no, you gotta be, you gotta act cool like gangsters, even though they are fucking gangsters. <laughs> he's like, you gotta act like Bunta Sagawa, you know, like, which is, like, the guy from Battles of the Honor and Humanity. Uh, <laughs> and, like, then they get all fucking intense about it, and they get all, like, super dramatic and shit. So cool. This whole movie is so cool. I really appreciate all the weird little references. Uh, the movie they make, the little, um, the trailer for the movie they want to make, totally looks like, uh, looks like some of the shit you see in, like, Lone Wolf and Cub movies. Like, almost exactly. Like, they, um, they do the same, like, weird, like, punch zoom and shit that they do on those. Or, um, there's a movie called Sword of Doom that's awesome. But it just looks like trailers for that. It's, it's very fucking cool. So, I've rambled long enough about this. I'm nearly up to like 30 minutes, man. Oh, I'm sorry, guys. But it's worth it. It's I get super excited about this movie. It's worth talking about. Why don't you play in hell? Fuck, but, fuck what Variety Magazine says. This movie's awesome. They just missed the point. Okay, I'm done. Sorry. Oh, shit, right? Little addendum at the end there. Um, Kenji Fukusaku directed the Battle Royal films, which is like, that's a movie everybody's fucking seen, Battle Royal, I think. And um, yeah, so I always thought that was Beat Takashi. I don't know why, probably because he's in them. But I guess Fukusaku directed those. Kenji Fukusaku. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, like, if you want to sample some some of his fucking cinema, you probably already have with Battles of, uh, with, a uh, fucking Battle Royal. But he's been making movies 
since like 1968 or maybe fucking earlier than that. So <laughs> yeah, okay. Now I'm really done. Actually out. I think we're at an even 30 minutes. That's long, man. That's like a TV episode. I'm I'm sorry, guys. 